All right. So Shane Bono with the Coastal Advocacy Adventures podcast is on our podcast. Yes. <laughs> so appreciate you uh, coming on and chatting about your your work um, locally. Um, Mike's been talking a lot about you. He's like, I think you got a big cheerleader here, by the way. Yeah, yeah. it's getting a little weird. At is it? it is. <laughs> I think it at is. times, but I he texts he texts me your podcast and was like, "You need to listen. Give him five stars. All this awkward stuff." Oh. So he's you got a fan here. I don't well, think I, he's mad at that though. No, no, no. The, the more sharing, the better for sure. Yeah, Sharon's caring. Well, let's yeah. talk about your podcast, man. So I, I listened to a few episodes. Love it. Um, you're not just a, a you don't spend time lo- only speaking about local things that sounds like you're along where there's water you're going to talk about yeah for sure so the, the title is coastal advocacy adventures podcast and happy to talk about that and maybe maybe get into work a little bit as well because yeah. i kind of do the podcast as a side thing to okay. to my work and so i work for coastal conservation association or cca yep. or nonprofit 501c3 we're a nationwide organization dedicated to conserving and enhancing marine fisheries, resources, habitat, fish, you name it, anything to do with the coast. So when I came on to CCA in 2016, I wanted to bring something to the table that they hadn't done yet. And so I thought, hey, let's do a podcast because yeah. it's a good, like you guys do, you have long form conversation, you can really dig deep into topics and it's, nothing's cut up into sound bites. So you can right. really go into any any issues that you think are important or or um, things you want to discuss that really take a little bit longer of a time. So I started the podcast right after I came on board. Like 2017 was was the uh, when I started it, and I have microphone will travel. So I yeah. take my little recorder with me and go <laughs> all up and down the coast and talk to different people about you know fishing and habitat and conservation and. You know, one of the more recent ones was a guy, he had a, his boat stuck on the beach. And so yeah. I went and recorded a podcast about his whole ordeal with, with his, how that boat got there. And so yeah, I'll talk about just about anything as long as it's coastal related. Right. Yeah. So what, what, what made you join CCA or want to work for them? You grow up being a fisherman, caring about the waters and things like that. Yeah. I, you know, if I look back in my childhood, I had, you know, some moments that happened in my formative years that kind of de- were defining and i went to school to become a veterinarian my father was a veterinarian and my, my whole life it was like you know it was kind of unsaid that i was going to be a vet too <laughs> i mean almost every every client when i'd go work with dad his clients would pull me to the side and they'd say so you can be a vet like your dad and and they 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 held my dad in high regard for good reason because he was such a great he is such a great veterinarian and great man and so i was like okay i gotta live up to dad's you know dad's over here and so i'm gonna do that too because i wanted that respect but dad did a great job of getting us in the outer doors growing up there's four of us an older sister and three boys i'm the oldest boy and so we would go fishing quite a bit and that was his passion and it's a good way to get us out of the house and so we would we'd head down to the coast and we didn't have um, a boat. We didn't have very much in the way of resources. So we, we knew some landowners or he did and my uncle did. So we just drive through their property to access the coast, walk in and wait and start fishing. And anyways, those, those moments really define my love for the outdoors and um, wanting to keep that for my kids and my grandkids and future generations was kind of just something that's really been important to me. So I came on to um, CCA in 2016. Prior to that, I was with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. I was a uh, hatchery biologist and hatchery manager for the Sea Center, Texas, which is the fish hatchery uh, just down the road in Lake Jackson. Yeah. Okay. So did you you have a greater love for fishing than than hunting or is it is it kind of equal oh it's it's i'm torn yeah. between the two actually <laughs> i i i love them both and it really it's um i will say i'm a more of a fair weather fisherman but if it's hunting i don't care i will do it in any <laughs> any conditions what, what, what kind of hunting do you do um i'm mostly archery oh. whitetail deer hunting and I'll 
go out for elk. I've never shot an elk. Uh, I've done a couple of back trap, backpack elk hunting trips in Colorado and love that and love just being on my own. My cousin and I have done it a couple of times and just everything you got is on your back and you got your bow and you're just stalking and calling and looking for elk and um, really enjoy doing that. I got to go on a Neil guy hunt, which was uh, down in the valley this past February right before the freeze so that was right almost you know when the freeze was on setting i was down there and so that was a really neat experience and i got one um but yeah mostly archery okay. um large game archery hunting is what i enjoy so what does the, the cca do to to help uh the, the coastal waters what what is a big movement that y'all are doing right now to to educate the community but also you know what are y'all actively doing so Oh, uh, this might be a little long-winded. So yeah, kick me, kick me under the table. <laughs> if I, uh, We've been kicking you this the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so CCA Coastal Conservation Association started in 1976. Well, found, formed in 1977, but a group of 14 anglers met in a tackle shop, Grieger's Tackle Shop in Houston, in 1976, and they were concerned for specifically for redfish, red drum. Um, there was a lot of commercial fishing for red drum, speckled trout, flounder, and the, the, the methods used to commercially fish those fish, um, were quite destructive in that when redfish come in to spawn in the autumn, in the fall time, they migrate from offshore waters to real close to the bays and near the passes where the bay meets the Gulf and they, they form these massive schools, and it makes them real easy to harvest. So commercial fishermen could come with huge purse seines and scoop up a bunch of these redfish mamas and papas or broodstock. And so when those fish are spawning, it makes them easy to harvest. And they were harvested in, in mass quantities. And then inside of the bays, um, commercial fishermen would use all sorts of various types of nets, gill nets, trammel nets, different nets that basically get the fish caught in their gills so anyhow there was a lot of over harvesting of fish that these fishermen thought that were important so they said okay we need to do something so they formed and there was this effort going on in houston there was another effort going on in corpus christi the effort in houston was called save our redfish the effort in corpus was called save our seas anyways they got together and formed the gulf coast conservation association Shortly thereafter, they formed a, a sports PAC, political action campaign, and they knew some pretty powerful legislatures at the time. So between 1977 and 1981, they were able to pass various laws, and ultimately they were able to get the nets out of the bays and then able to establish game fish status for red drum, speckled trout, and numerous other species. And so that kept them from being able to be commercially harvested. Okay. So happening all at that same time was quite a bit of research conducted on red drum, on captive spawning of red drum and speckled trout. And so CCA was able to kickstart a, a stock enhancement program. So hatcheries, fish hatcheries. And eventually these, these hatcheries were able to supplement the wild populations by putting little fingerlings into the, the bay system. So um, when when the hatcheries programs got established and Parks and Wildlife started getting a little more proactive with CCA's advocacy work, um, Parks and Wildlife got a little more proactive with their bag limits, their seasons, the um, how many fish you could keep, things like that we started to see these populations of red drum and, and speckled trout increase. Recreational angling since then has become more and more popular. So the work that CCA does to protect and enhance our marine resources continues to be important. And so now we've moved from, you know, just focusing on a couple of species, we've moved to continue to support the hatchery programs that we have but also do a lot with habitat restoration. So we're working to put oyster reefs in our bay systems. Okay. We do stuff um, in nearshore waters to put habitat in nearshore waters so that reef fish, red snapper, amberjack, 
things like that can congregate to those near shore reefs. So we do a lot of habitat work and we still do quite a bit of advocacy and uh, work at the Capitol to make sure that we have good fishery policies in place, not only just in Texas, but across the nation. Cause we have chapters and I think we have 17 to 18 chapters across the country. Yep. The biggest ones are Texas, Florida, Louisiana, Alabama, South Carolina. Those are five of the biggest. Wow. So a lot of these towns or cities or have these uh, hatcheries, right? Uh, we, we were in Colorado in um, Salida and we saw a big one there. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that this was going on. I don't really pay attention to this kind of stuff, but it's pretty good work y'all are doing to, you know, repopulate the ocean. Um, how long have you been doing this? So I started when I graduated a and Corpus Christi. It was 2003. And my wife and I, my wife, Lauren, she's a, she's a registered nurse and we wanted to get away. We had recently gotten married. So we wanted to go single, uh, no kids, right. double income, no kids. Um, so we were like, okay, let's go somewhere. So I was able to get a job in Virginia managing an oyster hatchery right out of graduate school. And this was at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. So she got a job up in Virginia. Anyhow, I started working with oysters and um, that really got me into the hatchery scene, the aquaculture scene. And so when we were ready to come back to Texas, I started looking for jobs and I had applied once before with Texas Parks and Wildlife and didn't, didn't get in. And so they had another posting come up and so I applied and it was in Lake Jackson. And so I came on there in 2006 as a hatchery biologist and five years later i became hatchery manager and all during that time i'd been working with cca on just uh, various projects and working with them on um i'd actually requested funding from them for stuff that we needed for the hatchery to do work that we we're we we're doing with southern flounder because we were trying to start southern flounder stock enhancement in addition to the red drum and trout and eventually they offered me a position so that's kind of how i transitioned okay that it sounds extreme, uh, like biologist. I mean, what is a day to day thing that you did when you worked for um, for the aquarium? Yeah, so it's at the at that sea center specifically. You know, there's there's the aquarium. There's the part up front that you see as a visitor, and anybody watching this, if you haven't been to Sea Center Texas yet, you should go. <laughs> First of all, because it's free, so you can't beat the price. Secondly, uh, you will you will get to in interact with marine organisms that some people know that they're always there but some people don't realize the diversity that we do have in texas so the aquarium portion of it really speaks to that diversity that we have along the texas coast but then behind the scenes is the hatchery and you can request a hatchery tour as well so that is where they have the captive red drum and speckled trout and southern flounder and you can go behind the scenes and see how they get those fish to spawn you know, the tanks that they raise them in on some days, you know, there's certain feed days you can watch them feed the fish. And they'll just take you through the whole larval cycle of those little red drum and speckled trout and um, show you how the hatchery staff grow them, raise them. Typically, they raise them to an inch and a half to two inches before they're released. So, you, you know, the day-to-day -day operations for someone that works at the hatchery is aquarium maintenance, taking care of the fish, uh, a lot of equipment maintenance so not that it's a production facility so it's very similar to um, folks that work down here in the plants you know you have, you have pumps you have cooling towers you have electrical equipment that needs to be maintained you have a vehicle fleet you have trailers you know it's all the same stuff and so hatchery staff have to be able to do anything from shovel to science and that's what's really beneficial about working in a hatchery system is that you get to you get to geek out on science if that's your thing but also you can get get down and dirty and if you want to go just bust it for a day and and <laughs> go clean a pond and scoop out fish muck all day then have at it you're welcome to do it so um it's really it's it's good for the mind it's good for the soul it's a really great place to earn a living and i enjoyed every every minute of it that's interesting i didn't know all that was going on back there yeah so they raise sea center texas 
Well, I'll just speak to the whole coast. There's one in Lake Jackson, and there's one in Corpus Christi, and then there are grow out ponds and Palacios. And so, all combined, those three facilities raised 25 to 30 million red drum and trout oh. fingerlings combined. And it takes about 45 days, 30 to 45 days from a fertilized egg to get to a size to where you feel comfortable stocking the fish out into the bay systems. So all during that time, they're taking care of the fish and the fish are grown indoors. Red drum and trout are grown indoors for the first three days of their life. And after that, they're stocked into a pond and then the rest of the time they're grown out in the pond. So you have to be able to manage the larval cycle and then you transition to managing a pond and all during that time you're making sure the phytoplankton levels are appropriate and the zooplankton levels are appropriate you're managing your fertilization schedule to make sure you have enough phyto you're like managing a life cycle in the pond you need the phytoplankton to feed the zooplankton the fish eat the zooplankton and then when the fish get larger you have to start supplementing with with some commercial diet some small pellets yeah. just so that they're able to get to an appropriate size that's nuts. Um, do, is there a high success rate once they're released? That's a great question. And Thank you. It's one, <laughs> Thanks. Very Woo! Good, Mike. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's one that gets asked often, and it's an important one to answer. So, back in the early two thousands, Parks and Wildlife set out to to begin to answer that question for red drum. So we have the answer for red drum. We don't have it yet for trout and flounder. So over a series of years, they are able to genetically track um, fish that were released. They took um, genotypes from the parent brood stock through, through fin clips and um, were able to match those back to fish that were caught out in the wild. And the, 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 the survival rate varied dramatically. So in some bays, in some years, they found like 0.2% were from a hatchery system. And then other years and other base systems, that number was closer to 20%. So the best way that I know to explain it, which is probably not a very good way, but I'll try. <laughs> Think of a base system like a bowl of cereal. And if that bowl is already full of cereal, you can't put anything else in there. So if a base system is already healthy and it has good natural recruitment already, whatever you try to put in there, it, it can't support it. So those fish are most likely not going to survive. But if there's a void in that bowl, then those fish are in that bay, then those fish can then fill that vo void. So what stock enhancement does, what hatcheries do, whether they're inland or coastal, you your natural recruitment of fishes can, can vary wildly from year to year, depending on weather, climate, depending on... Uh, fishermen's activities and you know pressure environmental reasons pollution whatever yeah so stock enhancement kind of takes those peaks and valleys out and helps smooth out that line of recruitment so that's the that's the main benefit to to the hatchery program so to directly answer your question it's as high as verified through genetic tracking about 20 percent golly yeah so it it all matters too how often are the testing is conducted like do y'all yeah when you're trying to genetically track the it's numbers not, it's not a routine that's not a routine nah. program that was kind of a, someone had asked that question said we need to answer this question so the the stock enhancement director at the time coordinated with texas a university dr john gold and they did a series of studies over a couple of years so it's something that needs to continue to be answered because if what you're doing is not working or if there's ways to refine it, then you need to identify that and improve it. Because I think the hatchery budget is right around $2 million. And I could be off on that a little bit, but the last number I remember was around $2 million. So that's for all the staff and maintenance and equipment and operate the buildings. But that's a good chunk of change. Yeah. That, And it's important to point out that that, that funding comes from angler activity so anything that parks and wildlife does specifically to fisheries and and for hunting too but your license sales go directly to fund the department when you buy sporting goods there's an excise tax on those sporting goods and that goes eventually gets back into 
through funnel through the department but gets put back into the resource so everything that 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 parks and wildlife does or that the hatcheries do is funded by recreational anglers so there's some accountability there right we need to make sure what we're doing is because people are investing their money in this resource through recreation we need to make sure what we're doing is is appropriate and and, and working so the budget's you said roughly $2 million and on an annual basis, y'all are producing over about 30 million redfish from. Yeah. The hatcheries are. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, 30 million redfish and trout combined. Those, okay. Those two species. Now there's also the inland fisheries program, like the one you saw in Colorado, mm-hmm. Texas has one of those as well. And they'll do catfish. They'll do bass. They do an exchange program with Colorado where they'll get rainbow trout from Colorado and they'll do winter stockings of rainbow trout and then parks and wildlife will give them catfish. So they kind of do a swap. And, and so they do a lot of inland stocking in lakes and then even city, city ponds, you know, fishing is one of those things. It's you guys are runners. So yeah. like anybody, almost one anybody. of those <laughs> <laughs> running, I, I think is one of those equalizers. Like, if you can lace up your shoes, you can get out and at least walk at a brisk pace. If you're somewhat fit, you can jog. And if you're in shape, you can run. Like, anybody can do that. To me, fishing is one of those things, too. It's very low entry. Uh, the bar's real low as far as cost is concerned. Almost every metropolitan city has, a uh, large city has a fishing program associated with it they have community ponds and then they partner with whether it's texas parks and wildlife or other conservation groups they partner with these groups to have these community fishing programs and so the thing that 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 is difficult with fishing is like if you haven't done it you think it's difficult it's a hard thing to do Mm -hmm. you know really really it's not and so it's it's a good way to get kids in the outdoors and that's another thing i think we'll see continued focus on is is trying to reach some of these kids in these cities that that think that they they can't get into this type of recreation but it's all everything they need is there we just kind of kind of show them the way yeah Yeah. i got one more question about this hatchery (laughs) let's let's hear it is there any like genetic modification at these hatcheries to make them more resilient or anything like that? Kind of what they do at like sa- salmon and stuff like that. Man, you are on a roll. <laughs> 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 Another great question. So no. <laughs> Loser. <laughs> next question. <laughs> no, next question. <laughs> no, that's a, so hatchery program stock enhancement have have a bad reputation because of what because of what you mentioned. So Texas Parks and Wildlife, I'll speak to them. I won't speak to any other stock enhancement, but Texas Parks and Wildlife like goes out of their way to make sure that that's not an issue. The red drum they bring in are brought in from the wild. And they do, well, since red drum, are, they spend their entire adult life in the Gulf of Mexico, so out of the base systems. And they migrate up and down the Gulf. Genetically, there's not any difference between a red drum caught in Brownsville and one caught in Sabine Pass. They're the same. But Texas Parks and Wildlife kind of does a split around Rockport, the midcoast, and the hatchery down in Corpus catches broodstock down south. The hatchery in Lake Jackson catches broodstock up here, uh, up north. And they won't, so Lake Jackson won't ship larvae or fry or fingerlings down south and corpus won't ship their fingerlings up north there's some mixing that goes along in the middle now with trout they keep their fish separate by base systems again to avoid any mixing of genetics and while they've done genetic work to show that there's not a lot of difference in trout there are some differences in the lower laguna madre so way down south compared to sabine lake way up north but in in sister base systems or base systems that are interconnected, there is no genetic difference. But still, Parks and Wildlife keeps keeps them separate by base systems, and they do the same for flounder now. Nice. So, but that's a, that's a really good question. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's what I'm here for. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up that 
um, you know, anglers or fishermen help support the sustainability efforts that, that, you know, Texas park wildlife, these fisheries are, are doing, because I don't think that's common knowledge. I think maybe they just think it's coming, you know, some folks, you know, people that probably are against fishing or against, you know, they want to protect the animals They're They probably don't know that fishermen, you know, hunters are helping support these sustainability efforts. So, yeah. And it's in our best interest. We were all angle. And I I say we're the original conservationists. Hunters are the original conservationists because the, these departments, parks and wildlife, fish and game, Colorado, whatever you name it, whatever state they, if they want to get those excise taxes that I mentioned from the sale of hunting, sporting goods, what have you, they have to dedicate their license fund revenues directly back into the resource. If they don't do that, then they don't get all of that sporting goods sales tax. So there's incentive for these departments to to do their best to manage their money and, and, and put it directly into the resource because they're getting all of this funding that additional funding that we're help paying for. So every time you go and buy fishing line or motorboat oil or, you know, a a new bow, I mean, there's a portion of the sales tax that comes out of that and eventually funnels back to those departments. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, your participation in the sport or in the, in, in the activity is supporting the resource. And that's, that's a good, that's something that people need, need to need to remember. You're not taking from the resource, right? Um, you're putting back into it. Let, let the departments will manage the, how many you can harvest or how your participation looks like. Like we don't need to worry about that as much now, but we need to keep participating because that's what's funding conservation. That's what's funding a lot of research that's going on in the out of doors. Yeah. Yeah, that's not um, the money's not coming from these magical places or the people that want to protect the animals. It seems kind of counter counterintuitive, though. Um, you know, we need to fish more to help protect the fish, or even you know, hunters will say that too. You know, we're we're hunting the animals to help protect the animals. Can you can you expand on that a little bit? Because yeah, to it, some it, folks that that doesn't make sense. So you know, Im- imagine the reverse of that. So we have we have a land. And that's public property, but it's just sitting there. There is no money to harvest the animals out of that land, to do any sort of habitat wildlife restoration, to uh, enhance the land for flood mitigation, what have you. It's just it's just property just sitting there. So. You could have a situation where you have an overabundance of a particular species, where you have, um, you know, flooding problems, where you have invasive species that come in, but you can't take care of that because you have no funding. So the 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 best scenario is the one that we're in. We have this public land wherever we have hunters that can access that public land harvest a few animals off of that and in the meantime that public land benefits from all of the funds that they've been spending on sporting goods and license sales and things like that so now these departments can enhance the land to the best of their ability they can mitigate for flood they can improve the natural habitat so they can invest money into making that land the best that it possibly could be so it's hard to understand that uh, killing something or harvesting something is actually helping the animal but you have to think when you think of management of our natural resources you have to think of the whole and not of the not of the individual because you focus on killing or harvesting a few individuals it doesn't make a lot of sense but when you look at the holistic picture of it it becomes clear right is is cca doing anything to combat commercial fishing so we right now we aren't I mean, yes and, and no, <laughs> because we're, we're really at the point to where we have to realize that some forms of commercial fishing are, are sustainable and they right. work and commercial fishermen need to be able to provide food to, to feed the people. I mean, it is there, there are some ways to commercially fish our natural populations to, to do it in a, in a way that's not, um, affecting, you know, the, 
the sustainability of that resource. So there was an act that was passed, I think it was 1976, 77, and it's been reauthorized several times, excuse me, is the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And it's a federal act that basically, it established these regional management councils. So the one here for the Gulf is called the Gulf Coast Fisheries Management Council. So they're in charge of managing um, federal waters, anything past nine miles offshore in the Gulf of Mexico, so any of those species that we think are important, red snapper is probably one that comes to a lot of people's minds, amberjack, king mackerel, various other species. And they have to manage them to a, a um, so that they're, that they're sustainable. And in that fishery are recreational fishermen, charter for hire vessels, so fishing guides, and also commercial fishermen. And so they do the best job that they can to manage the, those resources and so in all of that there is there is a give and take and there's a battle between recreational anglers and commercial fishermen still and and because everything is now like a, a small piece of a pie everybody's fighting for that yeah. for another slice and so it while it is contentious and it's not always the most pleasant environment to be in to argue with someone as to why you should get to fish and they shouldn't it's all done in the best interest of of the resource so we've done away with a lot of the destructive fishing practices that that we that we used to have along the gulf coast and and nationally there's still a, a couple of dirty fisheries i don't mind calling them out the Men- menhaden fishery is one of them um the uh, what, I, I why still, what makes them dirty though because they they, because I don't like them. <laughs> um, so they use they, the methods that they use. The, the, there's there's bycatch associated with it, and same for yeah. shrimping as well. There's can quite you a bit of bycatch. can you explain? Do you know what bycatch is? No, expand on that, please. Yeah. So, uh, so well, real quick, the menhaden deal. They use spotter planes to to spot these huge schools of menhaden they're they're and, the and, hog hunters of the ocean basically and but, then they'll come in yeah kind of and then they'll come in and scoop up a lot of menhaden mm. at once and it mixed in with that menhaden or other fish species sharks and red redfish things like that so it is it's a fish that's real easy to catch and you can catch a lot of them real quick now their states manage them to specific quotas and so they're supposed to stay under there's a cap and they're supposed to stay under that cap but um, like I said, associated with that harvest is is quite a bit of bycatch, and that's the issue with shrimping. And I can't remember the number. I want to say seven to eight pounds of bycatch for every pound of shrimp that you catch. So, baby snapper, Atlantic croaker, small redfish, all various sizes of other shrimp, crabs, stingrays, you name it. All of that is mixed in, so you can have your little Gulf brown shrimp. Yeah. And so, while I love shrimp, the more I've become educated on the issue, I have a diff- somewhat difficult time. I still enjoy them. But I, I, it, Let's it be is, honest. I, I look at them, and I'm like, Damn. dang, dude. What else had to die for me to eat you, you know? Yeah. Because all, all, those, those nets stay down for quite a bit, bit of time, and almost everything that comes up with those shrimp has been dragged for 45 minutes or an hour or two, you know? And so they're they're dead, and they just get wiped off the deck, for the most part. Yeah. So so bycatch, it's when they put these big nets in the ocean, and they're going for shrimp, but they'll catch shark too, mm. and then you know ten shark will die for, but they won't report it, right? So you said, oh, we're we're meeting we're meeting our sustainable numbers, but. You know yeah, what? What really is su- sustainable? You know. Well, and and so there's there's programs, there's observer programs to where the federal, it's like a temporary deal, but they'll 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 run these observer programs where they put somebody on that shrimp boat to log how much bycatch that they're catching, and they'll report that. So they'll kind of monitor that situation. A, a, shrimping has come a long ways, and CCA had a lot to do with it, and that we've we've required them to establish these bycatch reduction devices so it's basically like big holes in the net so Mm. so the shrimp move to the back of the net and if there's larger fish in the net hopefully they have the ability to swim forward 
and escape out of, out of those holes. Okay. And shrimping also devastates or has devastated turtle populations. And so in addition to the bycatch reduction devices, those nets have turtle excluder devices so that hopefully the turtles can swim forward and escape out of those, uh, out of those holes as well. So while it's still not the most refined fishery, there's ways, there's improvement to be had. They've come a long ways from, you know, the worst of, of times commercial sure. fishing is is, is tough right because you know so many people obviously want to eat it and we need to supply the food but it it has a little bit of destructiveness or a lot of bit of constructiveness um when when doing it are are, are you concerned about overfishing the ocean from a commercial perspective and then running out of fish there's certainly there certainly are areas where yes that's a huge that's a huge concern and and we're fortunate in, in in the u.s to to have laws that have been passed to help um curb that problem for us specifically in texas i have significant concerns for the status of our oyster fishery oysters are increasing in popularity and increasing in demand the price of oysters continues to go up and it is a limited resource here in texas and if you look at oyster fishery practices on a national level across a time series so across history you it starts with um, severe over harvesting and then coupled with some natural or man-made disaster and the populations Mm. plummet so with with oysters you want to make sure that the shell oyster shell gets back into the base system once they're harvested that's what the small oyster larvae will recruit to oyster larvae spend the first 30 days of their lives free swimming in the ocean there's a little plankton swimming around eating algae after about 30 days they will actually attach to a substrate so some hard particle preferably another oyster shell. So that's how oyster reefs build up over time is generations of generations attached onto one another. And so oyster reefs naturally should should be very complex. They should have a lot of vertical relief to them. And that gives them the ability to withstand sedimentation. So when hurricanes come in and it's blowing sediment everywhere along the bay bottom, those oyster reefs are tall enough so they don't get drowned out with sediment. So case in point, Hurricane Ike came in and the oyster reefs in Galveston Bay had been fished hard prior to that for numerous decades. And the reefs had very little vertical relief. And so 80% of the oyster reefs in Galveston Bay got sedimented over. They got covered with silt. That forced the oyster fishery to move to bay systems that historically hadn't been, hadn't had as much pressure. They had small localized pressure from like a commercial fisherman or two lived in Rockport and that's the only base system they harvested. But the majority of the fishery used to be in Galveston Bay and now all those guys moved down south, further down the coast. And so now we have increased pressure on smaller base systems and what has happened in Galveston Bay is starting to happen in these smaller base systems and we're vulnerable in the middle coast to a similar situation so we've got some work to do to make sure that our public oyster reefs are are going to be there for future generations because oysters are important not just because they're tasty like love love to eat (laughs) oysters but they provide all these natural ecosystem services so the one oyster will filter 50 gallons of water per minute they reduce um the wave attenuation so waves that are washing over a reef they'll kind of knock those waves down so that allows more sunlight to penetrate to reach the seagrass so seagrass growth benefits from it and they'll protect shorelines so same kind of thing they'll they're like a natural barrier for a shoreline so it decreases erosion so anyways they have all these ecosystem services that provide that are far more valuable than the price of the oyster in a half shell so we just got to make sure that we still have those guys out there to, to do all the things that the oyster does, but then also we have some some to harvest. So to that point, we've established a mariculture program here in Texas. So now it's legal for people to get involved in oyster farming, which is growing oysters in cages. 
So you're getting all those same benefits, those ecosystem services, but you're not having to harvest off of the public reefs. So Nice. So what is CCA doing to, to combat plastic in the ocean or to help reduce plastic waste? So we, we are not involved as much in that realm as, as some might think that we are okay. and something that we certainly would entertain getting more into. We do partner with local efforts here in Texas with the, the Nurtle Patrol. So University of Texas has, has a program where they'll go out and catalog and document where plastic pollution is coming in and this is more specific to the small plastic pellets the nurdles and uh doctor not doctor his dad is a doctor but jace tunnel is leading that program so we help fund a small portion of of what he does and we'll work with a&m heart research institute and university of texas marine science institute so if there's funding that they need for a program to help do that then we'll be involved we did just sign on to a support letter um, a representative Todd Hunter introduced a bill um, a few a month ago in this legislative session to permanently ban the release or the discharge of any of those nurdles, any of those plastic pellets. And we're hoping it gets a committee hearing and we'll be there to testify in support of it if it does. Well, is that the biggest um, concern, the plastic pellets, or is it is there other plastic types that are that you're seeing from your perspective? That's so. The that's the biggest concern for for me. I mean, all plastic pollution is bad. I mean, the larger stuff is easier to remove, right? But the, it's the small stuff that gets broken down, and you get into the microplastic realm. And once it's to that level, it's almost impossible to get rid of, and it's in the food chain. And so you got to capture it yeah. at either at the point source or when it's you know in these larger forms. And so. That's what Jace Tunnel, what he's doing is so important because a lot of the plastic pellets that end up on the beaches and the bays and lakes, it's just from negligence. And, you know, these, these pellets are producing these plants and they're loaded into uh, on these rail yards and, and then there's just negligent spillage and then it rains and all that stuff gets washed into their uh, stormwater system and ends up in the bay. So yeah. if they could just take the time to make sure that there's no spillage we wouldn't have near the problem that we do yeah the scary stuff is like you were saying the microscopic stuff they're finding it in the rain and on top of mountains and it's just getting everywhere um i don't know how we can stop that kind of stuff i i we we it, plastic production is such it's just integral in every part of our daily lives there is no in my mind there's no turning back right we have to improve the practices that that industry is using to slow the um, the the pollution and slow that down a bit. But yeah, it's it's in the ecosystem. I mean, it's one of those situations where, like, I don't know, I don't, I don't know how how yeah. we change. I don't know how we get it out. Have y'all looked at? Have y'all done any studies looking at the the organisms of the fish and seeing how much plastic is really in their bodies? We don't. I mean, we will support research that, that again, if, if UT or Texas A&M or you name it, university across the nation uh, is, is doing such research and they reach out to us for funding, we'll, we'll consider funding that. I mean, we, we fund a lot of um, research projects, not only here in Texas, but again, across the nation. So we don't, we leave that stuff to the scientists and, yeah. and just help support them where we can yeah. i was curious um to kind of go back to the commercial stuff um are they like overtaxed to to fund the, the hatcheries to you know give back to what they're taking because i almost feel like you're you know reintroducing fish to make up for what yeah so the hatch this hatch specific to the hatcheries those those are game fish those are recreational game oh, okay. fish so they, they're not at least in texas they're not commercially harvested or not supposed to be it's illegal to do so um, oyster fishermen, we were able to pass a bill in 2017, House Bill 51, that established a commercial buyback program so that we can maybe buy those oyster licenses back from the fishermen to get them out of the fishery. 
there's around 500 oyster licenses out there and around 300 of them are actually fishing so there's some that are just sitting on a shelf you can't buy one anymore they, they put a moratorium on those licenses so when they announced that moratorium a lot of oyster fishermen just bought as many as they could thinking that the value would go up and then they could resell them anyhow we passed house bill 51 to try to buy back some of those licenses and then with that bill we established that 30 percent of the shell that they harvest so the oyster is meat inside of a shell most shucking houses will shuck that oyster and then the shell they'll sell it whether it's going to be used for you know road-based material chicken culch you know whatever a lot of it never ends back up into the bay so now we've said through that bill that 30 percent of that shell that they've harvested has to go back into the bay systems so that is one way that they're being forced to to put back they also have a, a sack tax like a two dollar or something 20 cents excuse me 20 cent sack tax that goes back to the parks and wildlife department and that's supposed to go into that culch planting or that planting of oysters back out into the bay system so there is some some there where they're kind of forced to support the fishery that they're in wow that's like true what that seems like real sustainable fishing is like you got your your bucket of fish that y'all are are hatching in your fisheries and you're slowly releasing them in the ocean and you know anglers like you and i are are actually fishing what y'all are producing so that that seems like the real sustainable approach yeah and so it's not just and and that's just a small piece of it the the enhancement piece is small but you have to support the habitat that the fish are in you have to have game wardens out there to make sure that that john's not breaking the law all the time and (laughs) and keep him more than he should (laughs) so you have to have enforcement and you have to have fisheries management which is the piece that i didn't mention earlier was that biologists are out there looking at what's in the bay systems they're interviewing you at the docks and at the boat ramps to see how many fish you harvested so all of that data that they're generating gets inputted into the overall assessment of the fisheries and that helps them make decisions on is what they're doing is appropriate do they need to lower the bag limits raise it can we take more should we take less those those kind of decisions so in, in five to 10 years from now, what's your, your ideal situation for uh, the waters on the Gulf Coast? Ideally, in the next five years, we will, so Southern Flounder Stock Enhancement has become more and more important. So our Parks and Wildlife Department will have increased the uh, stocking of small Southern Flounder. Southern Flounder declines are related to climate change mostly, not so much overfishing, but more so warmer gulf waters leads to lower recruitment of southern flounder juveniles so ideally we'll start putting more southern flounder into the gulf and we'll help that population rebound ideally we will see this oyster mariculture thing take off and we'll reduce pressure on our public fisheries and ideally we'll the the 2021 freeze this freeze we had this past february put a hurting on our coastal fisheries. We had a lot of fish die as a result of those cold temperatures. So ideally by then we would have recovered our populations of spotted sea trout in, in Texas bays. And, you know, we're, it's important to mention that CCA is supported by our, our membership. We put on fundraising banquets all across the state. We have 58 chapters across the state of Texas. Each chapter puts on their own fundraising banquet. And so members show up, they have a good time, they, they bid on fishing trips and auction items and things like that. That money stays in Texas and it goes to support habitat projects, hatcheries, um, fisheries management programs, you name it, we put it back into the coast. I mean, most recently we donated $325,000 to build, help Sea Center Texas build the flounder hatchery. We just gave them another $131,000 to put new pond liners in, plastic pond liners, and we'll support hatcheries, we'll support habitat, we'll support anything to, to enhance the coast. I'm glad you brought up the freeze. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, what what was the total amount of fish that we lost here locally? Not, in, not only, I mean, were there estimations done in the waters too, not just in the hatcheries? Yeah, so the hatcheries fared pretty well because okay. they're mostly – 
supported um they have generators and huh. they're able you know they lost power but they were able to um run their generators and keep all their brood stock alive the brood stock are what you really got to worry about with the hatcheries in the wild an estimated 3.9 million fish died along the coast wow. but i will tell you that is an under estimate if there ever was one mm-hmm. so the parks and wildlife verified you know they went out in the days after the freeze and visually counted and checked and measured very numerous species of, of fish not all the fish are depending on the salinity of the bay and how long it's cold not all the fish are just going to rise to the surface and then float to the shoreline or 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 form a almost like a weed line of fish where you can go out and count them a lot of them it was so cold for so long sank and they stayed at the bottom trout specifically they don't have big scales and they fall apart real easy so as their bodies start to decompose they just turn to to mush so i suspect a lot of the trout didn't get counted and um anyhow I don't know where I'm going with this, but 3.9 million fish. <laughs> of that 3.9 million fish, around 9% were were recreationally important game fish. Mm-hmm. And in the lower Laguna Madre, uh, I think 109,000 spotted sea trout were counted. In the upper Laguna Madre, so closer to Corpus Christi, a lot of trout were counted. I don't remember the specific number, but almost you know, a large majority of the trout that were counted were from Corpus Christi South. So Parks and Wildlife enacted a 120-day emergency measure, and they changed the bag and the size limit of of spotted sea trout. So instead of keeping five, you could only keep three. And then instead of being anything over 15 inches being legal, they, they said you can only keep one from 17 to 23 inches. So they're hoping that some fish that are left in the bay system will st- will be spawning this summer, and natural recruitment will help the populations recover. So, what were the other numbers that were impacted as far as fishing? So trout, um, so tr- tr- redfish, anything like that? Well, yeah, there were some redfish that were impacted. Redfish have are a little more hardy. The they're able to withstand colder temperatures, um, not only get colder but stay colder for longer. Mm. Uh, flounder loved the cold, so they really weren't affected at all. But, you know, most, uh, a lot of bait, bait fish died. And so that kind of has a delayed effect on fish that we like to go out and catch. So we might see lower quality um, um, fish with worse body condition yeah. right now because there's not as much bait in the water. So that's that's a little bit of a concern. But it, it in every every event we've had in the past, 1983, two in 1989, it's taken two to three years for the population to kind of get back up to what we historically like to see them at. Those years are probably a little bit different because we didn't have near the amount of fishing pressure that we do now. So it's important that all anglers out on the water kind of remember that they're that they're one piece, but they're one small important piece to this overall picture of conservation and that, you know, they don't need to keep everything that they catch and they can, they should release some and only take home what you're going to eat. If you're going to eat them, Um, I would encourage no one to be storing fish in their freezer while we're waiting on these fisheries to recover because that's just, that's just a waste. I heard you on your podcast. You're, you're not going to keep any trout this year, right? I'll keep surf trout. <laughs> I think that I've I've landed. Yeah, I'm not keeping trout. Okay, but I surf fish a lot in the summertime. Yeah, and you know that's kind of like its own little population of of trout that weren't affected by this freeze event in the in the bay systems. So I might I might keep a surf trout or two. To where do you fish at? Give me the deets on on where the hot spots are around here. Um, your yep. best, I mean, longitude and latitude. Yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Drop a pin. Text me. I'll, I'll go with you. I mean, okay. I'm not the, I'm not the greatest, I, but I just look for there, there is a spot in Surfside that I don't want to say <laughs> while we're being recorded. Okay. That we can go <laughs> there tell us off air. That historically is better than others. I tell you, the jetties are, are, 
wonderful. Yeah, they're my, just my it's wife, so packed there though. It's packed. It yeah. can get packed. But Jetty Queen or my wife, <laughs> she goes and she she has a blast. Sheep said she don't care. She loves sheep said drum. Um, she's after the big jack. She wants to catch a huge jack Creville. Nice. Um, but she goes there all the time and and she never strikes out she's yeah. always catching something but no um advice on the surf you got to be mobile you got to be willing to to Pick drive up, and yeah. look look for activity and and certainly hit it early because do you like, only go to surf side or you have you have you been well i'm sure you've been everywhere but do you fish at sergeant too i don't fish so much in sergeant i mean i have friends that i occasionally will go bay fishing with yeah. but for the surf because it's so close yeah. just go to just go to hit hit fall it's island there surfside okay yeah got the i got the good spot now man. you write it down you're gonna find out no i'm gonna find out man <laughs> i think anybody that fishes but you already fish right yeah so, so it's on us to take a, someone that's never been take them fishing that's just like a Have charge you i'm not even in this conversation have you I'm been just, fishing just watching <laughs> i didn't even know what an angler was i just found out that was a well, fisherman you, you thought someone is like contorts their body or something yeah it would make more sense that way where did the angler I, come from the word ang- i don't have to go back to the latin i thought you came over here and i'm um, from boat and, and knew all this stuff yeah uh, I, i'm not ashamed to say i don't know it okay all. that's fine <laughs> that's fine we'll google it fisherman it is <laughs> Angler, I think, is like gender neutral. So maybe <laughs> maybe you're safer in these days to okay. say angler rather than fisherman. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm going to use it now. Now that I know it, I'm going to use it just out of context now. Just whenever of, I can. A lot of people say fishers now, which is always sound. Fisher person? Just fishers. Oh, really? Yeah. Fishers? Yeah, it sounds fishy. That's weird. Yeah. <laughs> like that. yeah. <laughs> I've been wanting to use that. That was a stretch, dude. But yeah. we yeah. need to, if you've never, I mean, we got to take Mike. I, I'm sure he be, you've been. I could be a spectator. He'd do good in the surf. He's so I tall. think, he, yeah, he'd go to the second bar, or the how third would, bar. How would John do? Not very good. <laughs> He's a bank fisherman for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we call him a bank fisherman. <laughs> it's true. I can't go to the second bar, man. Yeah, <laughs> the sandbar is so damn tall. Yeah, well, you can swim. So, I, so I'm sure we got to talk about grit too, right? We got to talk about grit. We talk about it a little bit, I guess. We talk about how, grit every episode. How long you been at grit? Yeah, I started in, I guess it was 2019. Wait, no, 2020, January 2020. Hmm, right before COVID. Right before COVID. And they had a deal where members could invite a friend for the whole month, and it was free for the whole month. So I had a friend on Facebook. I had worked out with her on another boot camp deal. Hadn't seen her in forever, but she started posting about grit and it was like middle of the month. And I said, Hey, have you done your friend thing? Can I, can I be your friend again? <laughs> and so she said, heck yeah. So I started going in the middle of January and I, so I had like two free weeks and then I signed up. So February was my first official month. And then the close down when the lockdown happened, like early April, I want to say, yeah. And then Grit did a really great job of handling all of that and making sure that members still, I mean, they posted online workouts and they kind of went virtual with their workouts for two to three weeks or a month. And that, I I wasn't great at doing that, but I appreciated the fact that they made that available. But um, it's been like everybody's had a challenging year for one reason or another, at least in 2020, I would say some more than most for different reasons. I certainly had my own personal challenges and that was therapy. Yeah. Being able to go to that place and feel welcomed and have this family away from your family was a godsend for me and love it. Love that place. Love the people, love the energy, love the community. Uh, I'm all about it. And it is kind of like a cult. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> very cult. Like, did you work out before you joined grit or, or I did no? off and on. Yeah. I, I did, uh, old friend, Tracy page. She had a total body performance, this boot camp thing. And I did it with her off and on for three or four years. Tracy page. That sounds familiar. Yeah. From um, Austin. Um, and she's been in Lake Jackson as long as I've okay. known her. Okay. So no, I, I don't no, know. Probably not. Yeah. Um, she should be. Anyhow, <laughs> she uh, she had a good program, and 
and and and through that, then I joined Powerhouse, which is now Evolution Fitness. So I yeah. still I'm still a member there as well, and I go there occasionally. Um, but off and on, it was never like routine and like a part of my daily life. Whereas now, whether it's four thirty in the morning with Mike or four thirty in the afternoon with my wife Lauren, like it's it's a daily thing, and um, I feel incomplete without it. Yeah, it's it's weird. Um, it's hard. I don't know, Mike, if you experience this, like when you go travel and go off on a vacation, uh, I like think back and like, well, I wonder what's happening. Right <laughs> what are they doing today? And that's kind of sick, but that's like, that's how much that, that, that I enjoy it. That's a good thing though. To we have, we have a good class at four thirty, and I think I get a little moody if I don't go. I think I'm, like you said, it's like therapy. You're like releasing something there. Um, but I think he was, as small as you when he started so yeah. look where you could be i know <laughs> how old are you 44 really God, he's he turned 44 and he ages like fine wine doesn't he he's an angler uh, though yeah i am an angler <laughs> yeah fit that in the salt that the salt, salt water that salt and that sun although the wrinkles are really starting to kick in so maybe i should watch the sun you got kids too right three kids lauren and i have three kids 13 11 i gotta think about this for a minute 13 11 and 8 three three kids two boy two girls and a boy you got them in grid or what? <laughs> Not yet. No. Um, what I signed up my daughter. Yeah. But she. She's not feeling it. She's not feeling it. Although she's an athlete, but she's uh, she'd rather go kick a ball. Um, so my son loves it. So we're bringing him in the afternoon sometimes. Nice. Yeah. All, all these kids. Was this after the oyster plant? <laughs> um. Yeah. This we came back to Texas and started having kids and that's kind of like the reason <laughs> for going back to Texas <laughs> oh I get thank you yeah. thank you John <laughs> it's been a while I'm a you little to, slow on the pickup right. that was the first time we used a high key wow that, I'm surprised you remember that one that was pretty good right that works yeah yeah oh wow yeah that's why they want them yeah <laughs> so what can the average person do to help uh your organization what I mean what do y'all need help with? I know funding's a, a big thing, but what can we do as our, yeah, our yeah, everyday I, life? I appreciate that. So there's, you know, it's it's simple. I mean, the, the, the most direct impact is going to, you know, you hear about a banquet and should go, you know, buying a ticket to a banquet and going and have a good time and, you know, maybe bid on a trip and, and support financially through that way. You can also, I mean, like and share posts on Facebook that are associated with us that help spread the message of what we're doing. I mean, certainly that's an easy one that everybody can do. The one thing that I need to mention this, we have a tournament every year, the state of Texas anglers rodeo or star tournament. And we tag fish, we tag redfish. Historically, we've had other divisions in shore. So trout, flounder, gaff top. We're not doing that this year. We're just doing a lot more tagged redfish. So the first five red tags that are caught when a truck and a boat, it's a $90,000 package. Mm. The second five that are caught when the, the boat and the trailer. The blue tags, the first uh, ones that are caught, the first three that are caught when a boat and a trailer. The green tags, same thing. It's just a different, different boat, different trailer for each one. We also have offshore divisions. If not all the fish are caught, if not all the prizes are awarded through a tag, then everybody that's entered goes into a lottery, a drawing. So you guys could win truck, boat, motor, trailer, whatever, just by entering into the, that tournament. This tournament supports um, kids' scholarships. So we award $325,000 worth of scholarships every year through this tournament. So kids' entries are free. They just have to buy a membership. So for them, it's $10 to become a member and they automatically get entered into the tournament. And same thing, if they don't catch a tagged fish, or if not all the tagged fish are awarded, if not all the scholarships, excuse me, if not all the scholarships are awarded through the tagged fish, then all the kids go into a drawing. So anybody that sees this and listening to this, we have 10 scholarships split up between that $325,000, so roughly $30,000 scholarships that we're going to award this year. And all you got to do is sign them up. That's awesome. To join and be a CCA member, and then they'll go into this drawing for these for these scholarships. When is this uh, tournament taking place? It's his. It starts Memorial Day weekend and ends Labor Day weekend, so okay. it goes all summer long. We'll release anywhere. We're going to release, start releasing fish next week, so they'll already be in the bay. 
but we'll release them over the next few weeks and then the tournament will start and then we're going to do a minimum of 120 fish and as many as 180 so we're going to do 120 right at the beginning and kind of see how quickly the fish are getting caught and then we'll do another influx of fish maybe two more influxes of fish as the summer goes on what happens if they catch the fish early before it starts um if anyone does that encourage them to like take a picture of it and take a picture of them releasing it and that fish is fair game for somebody to come back after the tournament starts and okay. and and catching it we're requiring that everybody release all the fish that they catch and only cutting the tag off okay that's a big component of the tournament that's historically hasn't been the case it's been a, a catch and kill tournament now right. it's all catch and release mm-hmm. and so you just pull the tag or cut the tag and then re- return that tag to a weigh-in station within 24 hours and bada bing if you're in the tournament you went you're you win a prize i can see a guy if you just... don't win if you're not in the tournament you should be <laughs> you'll never forgive yourself yeah a free truck trailer yeah i can see a guy in a lazy boy with a fish tank in the back of him with the red tagged red red fish just <laughs> waiting for the wait, wait, yeah. waiting for the time frame to come and he's like all right yeah we'll we'll pick them out in a polygraph though well they yeah we do polygraphs on all winners and do you really mm-hmm. oh yeah. wow yeah that's legit what if someone plus that's a felony now so they kind of don't want to do that mm. what if someone's just bad at taking polygraphs you know so Uh-oh. i've never done one <laughs> i've never done one but the the way that i heard they do it they they calibrate the equipment yeah. according to the person so they'll ask you questions and just based on your reaction to normal questions you'll be nervous right so they'll calibrate the equipment to your level of anxiety okay and then that'd yeah. be good all right so where can people get a hold of you where can they find you at on social media um, website at shane bono but no not bonnet <laughs> wow at, yeah at, at shane bono i'm on instagram and facebook um you can just google my name shane bono cca and it'll pop up there's there's there there's phone numbers on our website cca.texas.org and you can reach me there uh, you can instant message Mike. <laughs> he can get out. a hold of you. Yeah. He'll, he'll get a hold of you. Your biggest fan. <laughs> and the podcast. Yeah, the podcast. Coastal, Coastal Advocacy Adventures podcast. Um, You're on, on Spotify, Apple, all them. I'm on. You know, I haven't, I haven't done the RS. I haven't done the Spotify. I need to get with it. Uh, get on Spotify. Almost everything else. Yes. Yeah. But it's not videos. I'm not on, I'm not on that. You got a good look. Yet. You should do video. That, pretend that came out of Mike's mouth. Okay. <laughs> that makes more sense, right? <laughs> what, uh, are you going to do video eventually? I want to, but no. so the, this was um, part of my um, oh. secret interest. He's coming yeah. to, here today. Coming so to get some information. Get ah. some deets. Well, he's yeah. in, he can get the deets here as long as he gives us the deets on a good fishing spot. There we go. Yeah. So that's a good trade. Because that's, that's a, what trade. I care about. <laughs> we also, you were the first for the, uh, the third camera. You're the first podcast. I, really? You should uh, feel good about that. My big nose is like... We're going to get it. We're, we're, <laughs> we're going to get, get it. For sure. yeah, I got a big nose, too. It's all good. <laughs> you ain't going to be able to see me in here. <laughs> Luckily, I'm in front. <laughs> well, Shane, I, I appreciate it, man. It was fun. Yeah, guys, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Love what you're doing. Y'all keep it up. Well, will do, bud. Thank, right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.